Good morning, online viewers. My name is Cleve Scott, and this is my lovely wife, Valerie. On behalf of the entire Powerhouse Church, we want to welcome you this morning. And we're excited. We're excited that you are joining us this morning. We are going to have a power pack service. We are going to have prayer. We're going to have praise and worship. And we're going to have a mighty word, impactful word from our pastor this morning. Yes. So what we need you to do is we need you to gather your family together, yes. wherever you're at in the house. Get your notebook, get your pencil, get your paper together, and get ready for the word this morning. Also, if you can, snap a picture and tag us at phckady.com so that we can see your family joining in on the service this morning. It's going to be a great time in the Lord. God bless you. today, Lord God. We thank you that you're still sitting on your throne today. And we thank you, Lord, that you, in you, is everything that we need. Lord, I thank you for faithful members of Powerhouse Church who continue to just give and be sacrificial into the things that we're doing. And I pray, Father, a blessing over every person that has, has been sacrificial during this time. We give you this time. We ask your Holy Spirit to be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Powerhouse Church. Uh, great to be with you again here, live stream, if you're watching. Uh, let us know where you're watching from in the chat box. If you're watching with us and you're from, if you're from out of state or out of the country, just kind of type in where you're, where you're watching from. It would be great to know who's tuning in and, and how you're tuning in. Um, we're in a series that we titled Love Where You Live, and, and I want to kind of give a little bit of an explanation of why, why are we talking about loving where we're living? Well, you know, I believe that, well, I, I believe, and, and I read in the Word that when Jesus was asked about the commandments, he, he came down and he, he basically summed up the commandments into two, and he said, the commandments can be summed up into two. Love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So it always reminds me of the cross of Jesus Christ. And the cross of Jesus Christ is saying, love God. It's, there's a vertical bar of the cross that says, love God with everything that you have. And there, there's a horizontal bar that says, love people. And so... Listen, the, the reason that we're talking about love is because love never fails. And love covers a multitude of sin, what the Bible says. And, it, and God is interested in our connection to him. And because of our connection to him, our connection to others. See, it's, it's kind of like not right to think that all you need is a relationship with God because God, wanted a relation, God wants you to have a relationship with him because he wants you to have a relationship with others because you are the plan to glorify God and manifest his love to others on the earth. And so last week we talked about the family and we, talked, we, we launched our 30-day challenge and we said what we wanted to do was we wanted to strengthen our families because strong families can then reach out into their neighborhoods and begin to extend the love of God to others. So it, it, we have to kind of back up and say, how do we build strong families? Consistency, we said. We've got to be consistent. We've got to continually teach. We've got to develop habits in our homes that, that know how to get into the word of God, but also know how to get into the presence of God. It's not enough to just be in the word of God, although the word is important. It's also important to be in the presence of God and to know the Holy Spirit is moving. And then from there, he, he, he wants to build a strong church. See, the church is not the building. And, and during this crisis, we're figuring out that the church is really not the building. The church is all of our families that are everywhere, all over, the, all over Katy. And even now, as I get on Zoom calls, I'm reconnecting with people that used to go to church here that moved away for whatever reason. They're across 
in another state, and they're reconnecting, and we're encouraging them, and they're beginning to do the 30-day challenge even in other cities, other states, and God is strengthening an army. That's what he's doing. He's got us outside of the four walls, and now we've got to begin to build something in our homes because, listen, it's not just about you having a great home. It's about you being built up enough to be sent out into the world to connect with others. And I want to talk about that today, connecting with others. Now, I have an illustration. So before we start this message, and really every message, how many of you know that you have to be humble when you approach this book? If you're going to get into this book, you've got to have a sense of humility. Because if you come into church and you and, and you, you kind of you, you start seeing yourself, see, because this thing is like a mirror. The Bible says that that in James that if I if I read the word, if I hear the word, but I don't do the word, it would be like me looking at a mirror and then walking away and forgetting what I look like. Now. Most of you know, I have a house full of girls. So I've brought, I've brought the kit from the house, the mirrors, if you see this. So this is my wife, Yolanda's mirror. This is Amaris's mirror. And this is Alexis's mirror. And if Ashlyn still lived with me, I'd probably have another mirror. Now, if you can imagine, my, my bathroom is, it has a whole wall of mirror. And these mirrors. So you can't help but look at yourself. How, everybody say makeover. makeover. Sunday is, is makeover day. See, a lot of us get dressed up and we make over outside of here. and We come in here thinking that we're made over. But God is saying, no, I'd like for you to wait and come in here and let me allow you to self-examine yourself with the word of God so that I can make you over so that you can look like me. And so, listen, this mirror, I, I just, I got, this, I got this illustration last night, and I'm prepping you because when I get into the word and I start talking about the word and I start talking about what we're supposed to be and you begin to see the flaws in you, you've got to have a posture that you're ready to allow the instruction and the correction to come into your life. I, I, I like my wife's mirror. I, I can look at it, and, and it's normal. Man I, look, I, man, I look good. I'm just kidding. It's normal, but if I flip it, whoa, it's magnified. You can't see that, but I'm just, it's magnified. And you know, sometimes the word, so when you start serving God and you start reading the word, sometimes it's normal. You know, you can see your face, you can see, but then as you go deeper with God, that's why when you're in a church, somebody can see it a certain way, but you can see it deeper because the Holy Spirit works to show you what you need so that you can correct yourself so that you can look more like him. And so some of us today are going are gonna to see the normal view, but some of us today, I'm going to tell you, you're going to begin to see some really close-up shots of your nose. And you're going to need to do some work. Some really close-up shots, oh, good, goodness, my, of your eyebrows. And you need to do a little trimming, if you know what I mean, a little waxing. So God's word, it, it meets us where we are and it provides for us what we need. I love Amaris, you know, Amaris has one here and, and it lights up too, but she can look at this. The deal with Amaris is what I didn't like is if she gets tired of looking at herself, she can close it. And sometimes if we're not careful, when we get into church, we can close ourselves off to being able to see who we are. The self-examination doesn't work because we choose, because who chooses to, the mirror doesn't close itself. You have to choose to close the mirror. And so today you're going to have an opportunity to really magnify and do some work, or you have an opportunity to keep it open or close it. And then I love Lexi's mirror. Woo. So like if you, if you, if you, 
it, it even changes like, I, I don't know how to do it, but if you look at it like this, you can see when you turn the light on, you just see the imperfections that are reflecting in you. And the Bible in 1 John says, he is light and there is no darkness in him. And so when you come into church today and you start to examine yourself, you have to be able to turn on the light of the Holy Ghost that he would begin to show you the things that you need to see. See, these mirrors were not made for other people. They were made for us. What I'm saying is, you don't need to sit there and hold that mirror up to your husband. Your husband needs to hold that mirror up to himself, and you need to hold that mirror up to yourself. And, and if you're in this audience today, you, you gotta hold that mirror up to yourself. See, God made a mirror for you, and he's saying, if you will self-examine yourself and, and make the correct, the Bible says that the word of God is profitable. It's profitable to teach, to instruct, to correct, to rebuke. It is breathed by God so that he can make us into his image. He wants to make you over. He wants to make you new. Why, do I, why am I opening up with this illustration? Because I'm about to get into some things that are going to challenge you. And the, the worst thing you can do is to hear something in the word and say that that's not me. And basically you're doing this. You don't want to look at you. You want to look at everybody else. But well, God is saying today is the day we look at ourselves. So we're going to talk about loving people. Because we have issues with loving people. I mean, look at our world. Some of us do better than others, but I'm gonna ask you today to really dig deep. Before you give yourself an A at connecting and loving people, I want you to come and ask yourself, would God have me to go deeper? Maybe you're doing great compared to everybody else, but how are you doing compared to the word of God? Turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to read some scripture, and we're going to get into it. If you could start my clock, that'd be great. 1 John chapter 3. I'm going to be in verse 11, and then I'm going to skip down to verse 16 and read through 19. And it's going to be a mixture of amplified. Just bear with me. It says, for this is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love and seek the best for one another. So he's saying in the scripture, the message that we've heard from the beginning is that we should love and seek the best for one another. It's not a new message, it's the message from the beginning. It was the message from the beginning. From what beginning? From the beginning of the foundation of the beginning of time, God was interested in us relating to him and us relating to others. In verse 16, he says, by th listen to this, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. In order to understand love, we've got to understand that Jesus is the manifestation of love and that true love is the ability to lay down your life for someone. And we ought to lay down our lives for the believers. But whoever has the world's goods or adequate resources and sees his brother in need but has no compassion for him, how does the love of God live in him? Let me give you a really quick illustration. Did y'all ever see any of the YouTube fights on, at, at Walmart when they were fighting over toilet paper? Somebody's got five and one, somebody needs one and nobody's willing to give one. And the real illustration of having, having, adequate, having something adequate and being unwilling to meet somebody that doesn't have its need Verse 18, little children, let us not love merely in theory, with word or with tongue, given lip service to compassion, but in action and in truth, in practice and in sincerity, because practical acts of love are more than words. This is in the Amplified. 
19, by this we will know that we are of the truth and will assure our heart and quiet our conscience before him. So the inspired word of God begins to give us an idea of how to know that we're in the truth. And one of the litmus tests of how do we know that we're in the truth is how we relate to other people. So first John is basically saying, he's saying, you can't say you love me and not love people. I'm sorry for all the introverts that are listening today. You cannot not love people. You can't avoid people. God, people are the mission of God. So how do we love our brothers and sisters? How do we love and seek the best for one another? It's not, I I like to say this, even in leadership, me and Pastor Brandon were talking about this the other day. You know, it's one thing to love somebody by giving them something. It's It's another level of love to love somebody by drawing what's inside of them out of them. So I'm talking to leaders today. I'm talking to, if you're a pastor, if you're a leader in church, one way you can love your people is by helping draw what's inside of them out. Whatever it is that when God made them and formed them, that he put on the inside of them, the purpose that he put in them, the gifting, the talent, We love others when we as leaders recognize it, see it, and develop opportunities and experiences for them to pour out their gifting and to raise to the level that God intended them to raise to. That is loving somebody. Because the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, if we look at the mirror, that most of us think that our gifting is more important than your gifting. The truth of the matter is that a lot of times we think that we, they can't do without us, but we can do without them. But when we begin to shift and we, and we recognize that maybe God puts something deep in somebody that's coming up, maybe there's a 20-year-old that's going to preach way better than any preacher that's out there today, and we're waiting on a preacher that's out there today to grab him, mentor him, and pull that thing out of him and be secure enough to know you're going to exceed me and do greater things than me. We have to shift our mindset in what we're trying to do with the church. As I was reading the scripture, God highlighted some points for me. It says in verse 17, whoever has adequate resources, the world's goods, and sees his brother in need, but has no compassion. Compassion. The first thing that we need to look at ourselves with is how is my compassion? Do I have compassion? What is compassion? How do I get compassion? Compassion, when this, let, me, let me give you a simple, explain, a simple definition. When we see another who's hurting, who's in pain, or who has misfortune, do we react with a genuine concern? Like we genuinely care that this person is struggling? Or are we competitive? Do we genuinely care that someone is in misfortune, in pain, in suffering? Do we genuinely care that we had to turn away cars yesterday because we didn't have enough food? Do we genuinely care does, does it, do you genuinely, and not only do you genuinely care, but is it also accompanied with a deep, strong desire on the inside to do something about it? See, because a lot of us can care as long as it doesn't cost us anything. A lot of us can go home and lay on our beds and be with our families and, and say, man, I feel so sorry for so-and-so, but never do anything to alleviate the pain, the pressure, and the hurt. Compassion. Do we have compassion? Do we hear the story and does our heart ache? I hope that some of us are looking at it right now like 
for real. Because you can't love people without compassion. To, to what point, right, we, we think about compassion. Okay, Pastor Robert, I hear you, you know, compassion. To what point? It, it reminds me of the story of the prodigal son. Compassion has nothing to do with what the other person deserves or does not deserve. It has nothing to do with the other person's choices. It has everything to do with my choice. So in the, in the story of the prodigal son, the son, the son becomes to be dishonorable. We've read this story. He's dishonorable. He disrespects his father. He's not the, 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 the good son that stayed home. He takes off with the father's fortune. He, mis, he misspends it. He, he, he goes broke. But at a certain place, the son decides to come home. But I'm going to tell you that in that story, even before the son decided to come home, the father was, had compassion on him when he left. How do you have somebody compassion for someone that has done you wrong, that has disrespected you, that has dishonored you, that has taken the family wealth and, and spent it on him. How does a father still get up in the morning and, and, and look out the front porch and say, is today the day that my son's going to come home? Just when you think the level of compassion is here, God shows us a story and he raises it. The picture of a father that even though this guy was a knucklehead, this father is still saying, oh, I hurt for him. I care about him. I wish there was something I could do for him. Picture of Jesus. Romans, he says, but, but while we were yet sinners, he sent his son to die for me. While I was a sinner. So in the, in the worst moment of my life when I didn't want God, when I didn't care for God, when I was hostile to God, when I didn't want him, God had compassion on me in the midst of my dishonor and my disrespect. And he sent his one and only son to die for me knowing that I had to make a choice to receive him and I could choose not to. But he said, but I love you so much that I'm going to send him anyway. He took a chance on And he ta listen, he shows us how the compassion of God towards me is to show me, and God is telling me, I want you to have that level of compassion with those that are lost, with those that have done you wrong, with those that, have not, that are not doing what they're supposed to do. I want you to have that compassion with them, and I want you to trust me. That there's, there's power in, in, in the name of Jesus. There's power in the Holy Spirit to draw that person back when they see your compassion. So a lot of people say, Pastor Robert, how long have you been serving God? I've been serving God since I was in my early 20s. Well, what keeps you in? Why don't you run away? Why haven't you? Because I keep fresh the compassion that God had on me when he pulled me out of whatever he pulled me out of, man. And I just keep it fresh in me. And I, that compassion holds me. It becomes real to you. You get a revelation of how much he loves us. Let me give you some obstacles to compassion. You ready? Frustration. Anybody frustrated? Just look straight ahead. Don't look and don't say yes in, at the house. Suspicion. Irritation. Bitterness. Dislike. And anger. The Bible says that anger never produces the righteousness of God. In the book of James. It doesn't mean that, that, that you'll never get angry. It just says that when you get angry, just know that it, 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 staying angry never produces righteousness. See, those things can cause attitudes. So those are the roots. If, you, if you're frustrated, if you're suspicious of people, 
Come on, if you're irritated, if you're bitter, if you've got unforgiveness, if you dislike people, if you're angry, angry towards people, if you're offended in any kind of way, those are roots that hold, and out of those roots grow an attitude. And the attitude a lot of times is that the attitude that that, that person doesn't deserve my compassion. Thank God that God doesn't get frustrated with you. Or does he? Or is suspicious of you? Or is he? Because God continues to keep the attitude that I'm gonna have compassion on you. And sometimes if we're not careful, church, we begin to hold other people to a standard that we ourselves are not held to. Because God is compassionate towards us and he overlooks things on us. He, he, I'm not saying that he just wants us to sin, but when, when sin abounds, grace abounds more. And he's saying that when you're trying to serve me, I cover a multitude of sins. When you're reaching towards me, I cover you with my grace. But sometimes we get out of that and we want to be legalistic and we want to hammer somebody because they're, they're, they're missing it. And we forget that we miss it too. God wants us to self-examine and to say, hey, hey, do I extend grace like grace has been extended to me? Am I merciful? Am I compassionate? The other attitude that dries up, and I see this a lot, is the attitude of indifference. In other words, I don't care. I got my own problems. Now, this is probably not going to be popular, what I'm about to say, but sometimes I think Maybe I shouldn't. Sometimes I think, did everybody that came to get food yesterday really need the food? That's not up to me. I pass up. You show up. I think the best of you, and I think you need it. How many people that we turn away yesterday that really needed the food? That's a self examination. Do, do we feed off the free frenzy? The minute something's free and we get something for nothing, it creates a frenzy in the culture. And everybody runs to that thing saying, I got to get me some of that. I got to get me some. And you don't really need that because you're still working. You still got money. You can buy your groceries. Compassion. Compassion to give it away to somebody that really needs it rather than to hoard it. I told you, you're gonna have to be humble. And I'm not getting on you. If you took, if you took it, you took it, just eat it, just do it. Listen, I'm just telling the truth. I'm just saying what God wants to make you over. He wants to uproot some of those things that are inside you, that welfare mentality, that thing that says if I got to get it today because today is free and it's never going to come around again. Come on. God can supply your needs today, tomorrow, the next day, and forever. If he did it once for you, he'll do it again for you. Sometimes we act like if we don't get in on this deal, he's never going to do it again. That's not living by faith. God wants a church that's full of compassion. Colossians 3.12 says that we must clothe ourselves with compassion, with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, and with patience. How do you get compassion? Let me tell you something. Too many times in church, we try to give you five steps to get compassion. I'm going to tell you there's only one step, and it's spending time with the Lord. And it's allowing him to fill you up because he is compassion. He is kindness. He is humility. He is everything that you need. He is the essence of it. And if you put it in you and you put enough in you, you begin to leak. And I'm going to tell everybody that's watching by law, everybody leaks. The question is not whether you leak. The question is what are you leaking? Are you leaking CNN? 
What are you leaking? And everybody knows what that you're leaking, and everybody knows what you're leaking. Are you leaking faith? Are you leaking compassion? There's no shortcut to this thing. It's not a self-help message. It's a presence message. And until the church begins to worship God in their homes and begins to get filled up with the Holy Spirit and begins to put God on the inside of them, so much so that we're overflowing and we just can't help it everywhere we go. Compassion is just oozing out of you and kindness is oozing out of you and you're looking for somebody to bless. You're not looking to get something from, for nothing. You're looking to give it away all of a sudden you start looking like Jesus walking around from point to point seeing who you can run into and who you can bless and who you can encourage and who you can pray for and who needs a word today but if we don't fill ourselves with the word we'll have no word for no one else for anyone else sorry The compassion of God. How do we get it? We leak it because we're intimate with God. God never, listen, if it could just be five things that we do and it's just a set of rules, then the Ten Commandments would have worked. Come on, if it was about rule keeping, we'd be, out of, out of, we'd be in the clear. And it never was about rule keeping. In fact, he knew that rule keeping wouldn't get us there. You'd have to have an intimate relationship with him daily. How do you love people? You got to love God daily. I'm going to tell you, people will challenge you. Can I get an amen from anybody? Loving people is a challenge. Just when you think... It's been done to you, uh, something else will come up and they did it differently. And you have to choose. How do you choose that? You can't choose that empty. You can only choose to love them when you're full of the Holy Spirit. You can only choose to overlook the disrespect when, they're full of the, when you're full of the Holy Spirit. You can only choose to bless somebody when you know God's been blessing you. Compassion. The second thing that we need in this scripture, it says, but in action and truth, in the amplified, it says, in practice and in sincerity. I want to look at the word sincere, sincerity. It means being free from pretense, deceit, or hypocrisy. It means that there's a clearness, that there's a purity of motive, that there's an honesty coming from you. So when you're compassionate to somebody, it doesn't just need to be a a pretend compassion, it has to be a sincere compassion, where the motive is right. See, this is a deep thing. See, you you can go out and serve people, and you can be doing it so that you feel good. You can come out and do all the things that we do with the church, and they're good. But your motive could be, man, I feel so good when I give to somebody else. And you're not full of compassion and sincerity for like, man, I hurt that these people can't eat. And your your compassion and sincerity will will be tested along the way when you begin to be judgmental and say, well, I think they could eat. I I don't know if they should be getting this. Anybody with me? I'm just telling the truth. A sincerity. There has to be something that the motive that we have is pure. Every human heart is subject to pride and to pretense. Listen to me. It's not that you're broken. It's that we're human. (laughs) And humans, all of us, are broken. And we all are susceptible to pride and to pretense. It's one of the things that we've got to guard about our hearts because our hearts are wicked and they'll, they'll want to run to pride. They'll want to say, man, I did good at that. You know, all our lives, some of us have been just walking around waiting for somebody to tell us that we're good. For somebody to tell us, man, you sound great. Man, you preach great. Man, you do this great. Man, you love great. And all of that, listen, <laughs> pride doesn't care how it lives as long as it lives. And pride is so dangerous because it can live in religion. It can live in, inside trying to, to, to be something religious. 
And you can be doing all the things right. Come on, everybody. Don't, don't look, just look. You, sometimes you run into folks that are doing all the things right, but they're full of pride. And it's always about what they did and how they did and where they went and how they did this and how they did that. And before I got there, it wasn't that way. And when I got there, now it's all fixed. Listen, God's been doing this longer than any of us. Why, why do I say, so let, let me just back up. Why do I say that? Because I'm that way. So I'll be transparent. I'll throw myself under the bus. <laughs> I can be that way. In, in, in when it comes to leadership, I've done this, I've done that. And God is saying, man, you need to, you need to just simmer down, son. I found you a drug addict and an alcoholic. <laughs> Stop giving yourself so much. I did it. I've been doing it. We should have a gratefulness that he allowed me to join him to do what he's doing. Sincerity. It reminds me, I read a story once about the word sincerity, and in, in, it, it talked about the, the, the Corinthians, or in Corinth, it was known for its pottery. Corinth was known for its pottery, and he, they had all kinds of master uh, potters that would shape all kinds of pottery and make pottery. In the process of making pottery, if you're not familiar, you take clay and it gets wet and you put it on a wheel and it, you shape it into a vessel. And once the vessel's shaped, you dry it for a little bit. And then you take that vessel and you put it in the kiln and you allow heat to harden the clay so that you can have a usable clay that can hold water. So in the process of making that, when you put things in the kiln, if the kiln, back in those days, they didn't have temperature control, right? It was fire. So they had to, they, it was by trial and error. If you got the kiln too, too hot or if you got it too cold, that pot could crack in the kiln. And you could have wasted all that time of shaping and molding and material and you put it inside the, the oven and it cracks on you and now you can't sell it. But there were some, some guys that were not above board in, in that potters that, that began to learn that they, they, they'd take these cracked pots and they'd take them and they'd heat up wax. And they'd cover those cracks with wax and then they would, they would sand them down and then they would paint them. And, and lo and behold, it would look like a brand new pot that was A quality, but it was really, it had a crack in it. And that potter would take that pot and then he would sell it at full price. And you can imagine, George, you go down there and you buy a pot and you're like, man, look at this pot. It's a $100 pot. And you go home and you, you heat up some soup and you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to heat up my soup and I'm going to put it in this pot. And the minute you pour hot soup into the pot that's filled, the crack is filled with wax, the wax begins to melt. And your pot begins to fall apart. Because what was holding it was not real. The word sincere, if you break it up in Latin, it's the word seen, without, sere, wax. When somebody says, I'm sincere, it's saying, I'm without wax. I'm not trying to cover up something that's there. I'm not trying to pretend to be something I'm not. I'm allowing my cracks to be shown. When you say sincere, it's without wax. Are you living your life without wax? Is your compassion without wax? Or have we tried to cover up our, our, our real feelings on the inside and the fact that we're indifferent towards your, your pain, the fact that we don't care about your pain? Maybe that's not you this morning. I told you, you got to be humble. You got to come to this word in humility to hear it because it's useful to correct me. It's useful to instruct me. It's useful to change me. There's two ways. So, so you can imagine they were doing that and then they came up with two ways to test that thing. To find out is my pot 
Does it have wax or is it, is it live or is it Memorex? Anybody remember that? Nobody probably. Everybody's too young in the audience here. Is it real? Is it the real thing? Or is it a cover-up? And one of, the, one of the ways is they would, they would take the pot and they'd hold it up to the sunlight. And that sunlight, it could reveal the cracks. You hold it up to the sun, the S-O-N light. You hold it up to the sunlight. And this thing begins to show you, you got a crack. And you've been filling it with wax. And you've been covering it up and it's been working, but I can't use you like I want to use you unless I can break you and remake you. See, the only, the only solution to a cracked pot in that situation was not to be fixed, but it was made to be shattered and returned back to clay so that it could be remolded by the potter's hand to make it into something that could be used. God doesn't fix things. He makes things new. God wants to make you new. That's the good news. The encouraging part of this world, this word, is that if, you're, if you lack compassion and if you're full of cracks and if you're really not sincere and you're missing that in your heart, you can, you can remedy that by putting yourself into the hands of the potter and allowing him to break you, allowing the Holy Spirit to crush you, allowing the Holy Spirit to make you into clay that you might be remade into an honorable vessel used for honor. God is doing that today in our church. He's checking our motives. He took away our programs. He took away our bill. I'm not saying God did it, but I'm just saying what, what's happened in the situation is we've, we've, we're, we're, we don't have access to the programs. We don't have access to the building. But God is saying, but I can still make something of you because it was always really about you, what not, what not about the building. It was always about my people. It's always been about me building a temple. Then you are the temple that houses me. This building doesn't house me. His people house him. There must be a compassion. There must be a sincerity. And we've got to be able to test ourselves and to say, if I hold it up to the sunlight, is there cracks? The other way is pressure, heat. If you pour something hot into a pot that's being held together by wax, it will melt the wax and the pot will fall apart. Crisis always reveals character. Crisis always reveals character. My thing, my message to everybody today is are we willing to look ourselves in the mirror? Are we willing to get real with God and to say, okay, Lord, show me where I lack compassion, show me where I lack sincerity. Father, help me to be a man or a woman that is quick to self-examine myself and to make a change. Because, not, not because I want to be something, but because I want to look like you. I want to know that every time I go to the mirror, I look more like you. I want to go that every time, I want to know that every time I go to the mirror, that I'm willing to look like you. I want to know every time I go to the mirror that I'm not condemned, but I welcome it. <coughs> maybe you're on the live stream today and you're far from God. Listen, maybe, 
Maybe you've made mistakes. Maybe you feel far from God. He's not far from you. In fact, you're listening right now at this moment in the, in the, in the broadcast, you're listening right now because he set this up for you to hear this. And let me tell you something, you've never gone too far. When the prodigal left, he, said, he told his daddy, give me what's mine. But when he came back, he said, make me into whatever you want me, into whatever I want to be, whatever you want me to be. There's a song that says, make me a vessel. Make me whatever you want me to be. How do you return to God? How do you say yes to Jesus? You, you repent of your sins and you say, Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I've done, for the disrespect, for the dishonor, for walking away. And you turn around and you say, make me into whatever you want me to be. It's that simple. There's no special prayer. If, if, if that cry comes from the heart of a man or a woman, God runs to you and immediately he restores you, redeems you, and reconciles you immediately. And then the journey of changing begins. So I want to encourage you today, if you're listening to me right now, and you're thinking, man, I don't have compassion for people. Man, I'm not sincere. I don't even feel God. I don't even know God. I don't even know what I'm supposed to be doing anymore. This thing's got me all wrapped up. I, I, I spend more time just worried and, and I, I don't know God. I don't have a relationship. I don't even know what intimacy with God. If that's you, this cry from the Lord, I'm appealing to you like God is appealing to you. Be reconciled to God. D repent. Just get on your knees right where you are and say, Lord, forgive me for walking away from you, for not recognizing you, for taking you for granted. You've had me covered all these years. Today, I make a decision to turn to you and to say, make me. And in that moment, God's, gonna, God's coming right now. To anybody that's doing that right now on live stream, he's coming and he's saying, I accept you. He won't turn you away. If you say, make me, and you mean it, he won't turn you away. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord God, that you make all things new. I thank you, Lord God, that even if we're cracked, that we're not beyond being made new again. And I thank you that throughout my entire life, Father, you have broken me and made me new multiple times. You have broken me and made me new multiple times. And I, I pray that these folks that are listening today, those that are on the fringe, that think that you don't love them, that think that you've given up on them, that say he hasn't given up on you. If he won't give up on me, he won't give up on you. So Lord, be with them today. Bless them today. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all. Have a great Sunday. We'll see you guys.